Today, the ethics and implications of facial recognition may slow surveillance technology, but will it? You're muted. I do not hear, oh, there you are. All right. Go ahead. Then tech companies say the, su the support racial justice, but their actions raise hard questions. And what are quantum dots? And why should we care about them? I'm Alexis Cordato, and this is Future Forward. I am Stephen Rosenbaum. Let us launch. Hey, Alexa. Hey, Steve. You got sun. I, I did get a lot of sun this weekend. <laughs> Bravo. Well done. Um, I, you know, it's hard to be optimistic given the number of rather complicated things going on in the universe, but it does seem like things are going in a good, slightly less terrible direction. <laughs> I think it's, we're all just adjusting. Like it just, it feels more manageable because I think our expectations are managed. So in my little hit parade of journeys, I went to Starbucks. Wow. You know something about the plastic cup? I know it's bad. It should be recyclable. No, an, an iced coffee on the Upper West Side is like, you know, can't complain. And, and then I uh, I went to Zabar's. Oh, now there's, there's a treat. I just want to say, much as I appreciate everything they did and I wore a mask and gloves, the idea of social distancing in Zabar's is kind of a little oxymoron. A little bit of oxymoron, yeah. All right, so we have three chapters today. We're going to get right to it. Chapter one is facial recognition and rethinking its implications, which will be really interesting. Uh, then chapter two, uh, we're going to look at words and why words matter, but actions actually matter more, particularly for tech companies. And then chapter three is quantum dots. Uh, not to be confused with the dots you get like at the movie theater, like the candy dots. These are quantum dots. Um, but, but let's start with the facial recognition thing, because, you know, at least at the outset, it seemed like just flat out good news. Mm -hmm. Amazon's banning police from using its facial recognition technology for a year. This is from The Verge. Um, so is it just good news? Are we good? It's a moratorium on it for a year, right? So, I mean, I think the, the pausing is good, but nothing is definite, right? Because the technology itself is, is still flawed. So does that mean that Apple will roll back the facial recognition on my phone so that I can't open my phone by, the, the mask thing makes the phone facial recognition kind of moot anyway. Right, yeah. Which is hilarious for me that I... <laughs> it, it is funny though how quickly we become comfortable with things that seem in, 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 not invasive for a moment and then quickly seem, uh, I don't even know what the word is, but like, it's like a, uh, you know, you can't do without it. I don't even know. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think it's, again, a year buys us a lot of time to really evaluate the algorithm, the applications of the technology. Like it's, it's a good thing, but is it long-term a good thing? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, um, I just want to say, just going back to my, problem with the mask and the phone. Trying to punch my code in with glove with with plastic gloves on is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, so wait, did you just take your passcode off and your face face uh facial recognition and you're oh, just kind of oh, can I do that? Can I just like go free yeah. free what you can like, free yourself. No oh, passcode. Wait, wait. All right. At the at the risk of sounding a little bit tasteless, I could go like digital commando. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, you could. I. You know what? Done and done. Yep. All right, people. So I'm just I'm announcing to the world. No more passcodes for me. I'm I'm just gonna. There's some Seinfeld joke that, in here somewhere, that, but I'm like that is freeing. That's that's liberation. Digital I'm, liberation. I'm doing it. All right. So here's my thing about Amazon and the one year moratorium. Uh, I appreciate it, but. It seems to me like a lot of companies are trying to get ahead of this rolling. They're, they're making a list of all the bad PR things that could be ahead and saying, let's just get out ahead of them and do something 
until until the spotlight passes on to another thing, right? Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe a year from now we'll be back to talking about global warming, and then we can switch back on. And and you know, certainly, you know, it's a double it's a double whammy for Amazon uh, for Amazon because it's like they're banning police from using facial recognition, right? So it's like a Black Lives Matter thumbs up, and it's a because we know that part of the problem with facial recognition is it does a historically really bad job of, 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 of being able to identify black faces. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like a double, it gets them out of the facial recognition quagmire that they probably were about to roll into. It means they can kind of zing the police without actually zing. It's a, I mean, it's a, whoever, whoever made the decision from a PR perspective certainly gets an A for the day. Right. Um, on the other hand, the IBM announcement was different. I mean, the IBM, which I, which I think I liked more. Um, you know, this is the Business Insider piece. IBM well, wins praise for halting sale of its facial recognition tech. Yeah, I mean, in this case, it's uh, it's impacting their bottom line, right? Like they're just they're flat out just not selling it, and they're they're actually stopping it. It's not a moratorium. So let, let me play devil's advocate here, which seems to be the mood I'm in. Like, does anybody really, like the thing about technologists, it, it's a little like, you know, baby cloning. I mean, we know at the end of the day that like anything that technology can invent, I mean, the government can spend all the time it wants setting up rules and laws, but like, doesn't all technology eventually make its way into the ecosystem? I'm like, does IBM really do anything to change facial recognition other than decide it doesn't want angry employees? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I'm sure you could follow some sort of trail, maybe some obscure patent or something, right, where all roads will eventually, like, lead to this technology. But I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they're making a policy change, saying that they don't want to sell it. They don't want to include it in into in their portfolio or suite of how they make money. So I've been thinking a lot about digital identity lately because I'm I'm in and out of thinking about the fact that I might buy and install a Nest thermostat hmm. or a couple of, or a couple of them. Okay. Uh, and on one hand, I don't think there's a whole lot to learn from when I turn my thermostat up or down, except when I'm out of the house, which mm -hmm. I'm now, I guess the answer is I am telling the Google that. Um, but but it's definitely, it's between Nest and Echobee. And mm -hmm. Echobee has no data gathering that I'm aware of anyway. Uh, yeah. it, it's, not, it's not a web enabled product. It's connected to your devices through Wi-Fi, but not out into the web, at least I don't think so. Somebody's gonna ping me now and tell me I'm totally wrong, which I, I very well may be. But uh, but Google is an advertising company, and I've I've taken a little bit of a pause there and thought, you know, do I really want to tell them that? So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess that's why, as I don't want facial recognition to be out in the world for evil, but I do want it to be out in the world for convenience and good. And it might be that those two things aren't just can't be mutually exclusive. That's my fear. I mean, I think the way you're evaluating the two products, like uh, Nest and Echobee, or I mean, that's a great way. It's like, is is the data is the system closed, and is the data being gathered and consolidated somewhere, or is it a more uh, open platform and or something where you as a user are controlling the data? So somebody can ping us on. Facebook and answer this, but like as best as I can tell, it's almost impossible to see the Nest platform unless you log in, you set up an account and log in, in which case the first thing that the platform does before it lets you see any of its features is asks to see a Nest device in your home. So they've set it up so that like, and there's a bunch of videos on YouTube, you can kind of get a sense of it, but the real kind of nitty gritty of how it works seems to be visible only if you've already got a thermostat and have it connected to the device. To, um, and by the way, I'm not talking about Nest cameras. That's another whole thing, you know, which I find creepy and I don't live in the suburbs, so I don't need them. All right, so 
So then there's this last piece about facial recognition, which is Amazon facial recognition that study says could be biased. This is January of 2019, so it's a little ways back. But um, uh, again, I, I'm gonna slightly, you know, I, how can it not be biased, right? How can it not be? Right, well, I mean, how, how, I think the answer to that is, are the people making the software, uh, is there, is there, are they more diverse? And are they asking better, smarter questions? I mean, that's the only way for it to get less biased. All right, so here, I'm at the risk of getting myself in trouble. So if you're a retail store and you're trying to figure out people walking in the door, whether or not you have a problem, and whether or not you need to have security be aware of it, what data do you feed into that algorithm? Is it crime data? Is it police recognition images from a, you know, somebody who got arrested and has a mugshot? I mean, you. so if you feed it any kind of public data, it's inevitably going to make decisions about, you know, affluence and bias and race and all kinds of things mm -hmm. that are gonna make you, that are gonna be terrible. Yeah. They're not gonna be, you know, so I, I mean, we, we've talked about this on the pod before, but it's like, like, how can your insurance company not treat you differently as a healthcare risk if you smoke? Yeah. Or go skiing or ride a motorcycle or take recreational drugs. I could keep going, right? I mean, these are all things that are intensely private, except they're not if someone's going to have to pay out an insurance claim. Right. Um, well, I think uh, for starters, you know, we <laughs> the awareness that algorithms are biased is a step in the right direction. I agree. Next, right, having more diverse teams who can actually like account for sort of outliers or more comprehensive data sets and advocate for that in the development process, another step. And then third, obviously we as a society have to change the inputs. Have you had any run-ins with facial recognition or positive experiences? Um, I mean, it, it was uh, last time I traveled internationally when I went through TSA. Um, I have global entry, and it was pretty incredible. I didn't have to touch and fingerprint myself. I actually just had to stand in front of a, a screen, which was good because COVID was like kind of heating up, so I didn't want to touch anything. So that was like a good application where I was like, okay, that the government, I guess, had some type of facial recognition software and, and could identify me. So I, I, that's fascinating. Not only do I not have global entry, but I've never even remotely considered getting it. Mm, well, and I travel not, not, I mean, internationally, you know, with, with some regularity mm -hmm. and, you know, it's always horrible, particularly at JFK. Yep. Um, There's nothing more VIP for me than getting off a long international flight and then being, and then deplaning and being in a cab home in less than like 15 minutes. Like that actually feels like magic. See, I, every time I think I've got your politics figured out, you go and surprise me. <laughs> It, it, it's but but but, like, but it's a great example because it's the convenience exhaustion misery versus privacy battle, right? It's like, yeah. um, <laughs> so so. What about on the U.S. border? If you go to Canada for a weekend and they want to look at your phone? No, I'm not into that. <laughs> but 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 they, but they have permission to now do that, or they've claimed permission. Yeah, I mean, I, I have I have nothing to hide, so I guess sure, like knock yourself out. But you know I have what? Lots of you know what? I bet you do. Hmm? I bet you do. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so I bet everyone does. That's I I so I have this conversation a lot with people who say, well, you know, if you're not a criminal, it's, just, it's like everybody has something that they hide. Everybody has a health matter or a family issue or a bill collector chasing them for some past thing, they debate it. You know, there was a great thing on Facebook that someone was um, canceled their, um, a, a teacher uh, 
finance, uh, they were members of a teacher's union and they paid off their, their credit card or whatever it was, their, their loan. And after they paid it off, there was a bill left over because it was a little bit of interest that hadn't been paid. The bill was for two cents. Oh. And they couldn't let the, and the student and the loan company wouldn't take the two cent payment and their, their uh, FICA score dropped by a hundred points because they were dinged for be for not paying an unpaid bill for two cents. Holy cow. And they went round and round with the, with the student union uh, trying to get it paid. And they were like, well, you have to wait till Monday and we have to do an override. It's like, like, but meanwhile, your, 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 your credit score is dinged and it never comes back. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea. So, so I assume that if I, if I were a TSA agent and I looked at your phone, I would see something that I would look askance at either a website you looked at or a group you're a member of, or a book you've read or a, 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 a sketchy cartoon you'd shared. I mean, we, you know, or a something, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, I mean, this is, I mean, we're at a moment where police and privacy are, you know, the number, you know, there, there's all kinds of good things happening, right? I mean, we're going to outlaw chokeholds. Right. Because how are they not outlawed? We're going to actually let citizens be able to look at the disciplinary history of police officers because, yes, of course we should. Um, anyway, uh, so facial recognition, uh, I'm going to vote for the one year thing is just a is a PR play and everybody knows it's going to be here and it's going to be baked into everything. I, I can support that. And I think you're going to walk up to your door and your nest lock is going to go, hi, Steve. And the door is going to go click. Yep. All signs point in that direction. Right. Um, all right. So should we move on to chapter two, which is equally complicated and, uh, um, uh, maybe just as important, but um, yep. maybe more important. So this is an LA Times article um, about what tech com companies are saying about uh, about Black Lives Matter and so and racial justice. Um, so on paper, boy, everybody's doing the right thing on paper. Sure. I mean, I don't think companies really have a choice. Like if you're not if you're not on the bandwagon to dismantle systemic racism, then you're on the wrong side of history. But like even the NFL came out and, you know, I mean, a lot of people are like, you know, there's, I mean, there's this crazy meltdown going on at Condé Nast between Epicurious and Bon Appetit and Vogue and, you know, and everybody apologizing and people getting fired. And I mean, it's like, I don't mean crazy in a bad way. I mean, crazy in a good way. Yeah. Um, uh, and and unclear, but 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 one of the things I saw maybe it was on Twitter or Facebook the other day was somebody posted stop posting words and post a picture of your board of directors, right. which I thought was just awesome. Like yeah, there we go. Like show me how many white faces and how many faces of color because you know that would be really interesting. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, we were we we started this conversation last week just in terms of everyone sort of coming out saying things. This this LA Times article, I think, is sort of breaking it down. Like, what were the actual statements, and then what are some of the the problem areas? I guess where it would be even better if these companies took action. So so let's go through them, and then let's see if we think anyone's going to do it. Okay. Um. We're, um, Starting with Amazon. So they yeah. said, uh, inequitable and brutal treatment of black people in our country must stop. Together we stand in solidarity uh, with the black community, our employees, customers, and partners and the fight against systemic racism and injustice. And, uh, you know, I guess here here's an example though, uh, tying back to the last section where it, it calls out the ring, right? Which is using um, surveillance technology, right? In partnership with 200 police departments. Um, so I don't know, Steve, maybe you might be right, which is that there's 
there's the saying and then there's the doing, but maybe the doing is also masked in this PR spin. You know, part of it is, you know, I have friends that work in a number of these big companies. And one of the things they say is there's this whole nice public face thing. We care about you. We care about, but we're going to make a difference. We're going to you know, give everyone 50 cents an hour raise, whatever. And then there's the internal pressures, which are, we have our KPIs, we have to hit them. To hit them, we need to do what we need to do. And in order to do that, we need to continue to grow, you know, audience and exposure and sale of the ring and people's use of the ring. We have to promote that the ring device actually protects people from, so so like, like if you're a bunch of notches down the food chain, um, you're, uh, you're still being held to numbers that, you know, are, pretty demanding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That being said, um, I, 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 as you go for, you know, so, so let's talk about next door. Do you, so use, do you use next door? I actually do use next door. And the thing that I found problematic with next door isn't mentioned in here. There was something with their moderators during black lives matter where a bunch of posts, were flagged and user accounts suspended because they were talking about it. Wow. Mm hmm So there was something that went awry, I guess, in terms of moderator policies, training, or maybe even their algorithm that flags uh, controversial uh, content. And uh, yeah, it was like, it was infuriating. I I am I've signed up for it, but boy, in New York, it's really not built for tightly populated areas with tall buildings. They'll be like, "Hey, Steve, you have a new neighbor named Fred. He's within two blocks of you. You should go say hi." I'm like, "What? <laughs> right. What? Do you know how many people are within two blocks of me?" Yeah. No, thank you. No, I. Um, that being said, um, I I you know I guess I don't know enough about about next door to know whether it's like a friendlier, better moderated Craigslist. You know, if you want to find out like, Hey, does anyone have a good recommendation for a, a hardware store? That's like not a big box retailer in the area. Where can, where can I go? Yeah. Uh, for another pod, we can talk about consumer feedback because I, I have strong feelings about it, but not for today's show. Let's, let's jump over to Google. So let's talk about what they said and what they're actually doing. What the, what the record shows, as the LA Times says. Okay. So they said. So um, Chief Executive Sundar Pichai said, "Quote: Today, the U.S. and Google on U.S. Google and YouTube homepages, we share a support for racial equality and solidarity with Black community." And goes on and on, and says other nice things. Um, but then LA Times does the research and says. Google employees' demands for more diversity inside the company contributed to a November 2018 walkout by more than 20,000 people. That's no joke. That's a big number. 20,000 yeah. people walking out. Um, um, as of May, black employees made up just 5.5% of the company's more than 100,000 global employees. That's up from 4.8% in 2019. Um, it's just so funny, right? Because you look at, yes, the jump from 4.8% to 5.5%. Yes, it, it's it's movement, right? But if you were to say, hey, we sold, um, you know, an, an increase of point, um, point 0.7, like less than a percentage more of any Google product, I'm pretty sure like revenue leaders would say, not good enough. So let's let's unpack this for a minute. So do you think these companies are like, is there such a thing as implicit bias training for for like corporate outlooks? Yeah. And I mean like they they do it, right? But do policies reinforce that because like Google is one of the companies that actually will not hire you as a software developer unless you have a computer science uh, degree. Like think about that as a credential. Hmm. So 
I'll call out bullshit on on not Google, but a different. I've been writing a lot about about Reddit. So um, uh, Alexis Ohanian, big press push ten days, five days ago. I'm stepping down from the board, and I think the board should hire a black board member. Mm -hmm. Gets gets enormous press. Um, begs the question of why stepping down is a an awesome thing to do, but let's set that aside for a moment. He challenges the company to replace him with a black board member. Mm -hmm. Three days later, they hire a black board member. Yep. Mike Steibel, mm -hmm. who is also part of Y Combinator and who's a longtime friend of the company. So let's unpack that for a moment. Did Alexis not know that they'd already chosen a black board member to replace him? Or did he do a little theater where he said, you should get a black board member. I don't know who it might be, could be somebody. And then they did a magical three day search, did all the background checks, figured out it was the perfect person and put him on the board. Or is that just utter total bullshit? Uh, so I, as, as someone who has been on sort of a PR Mark, Marcom side of things, usually it's like there's, it's like a bunch of things line up. There's an idea. There's something that maybe is in progress. And then there's also a good story. And anytime those three things kind of are directionally aligned or there's an opportunity to kind of do it, then it makes everyone's jobs easier. So, so uh, you know, I have a, I, I think, I, I disagree with you strongly on that. Um, hmm. I think he's lying. I think when you say you should hire a black board member and the board, whoever they be, because they won't quite tell you who's on the board, does a, they don't say we're doing to do a search. We're going to look for the best person. We want somebody who comes from an independent point of view. We want somebody who's really concerned about racism on the platform. They say, hey, we have a black friend. And by the way, we've been talking to him about joining the board. And he said, yes. So mm. abracadabra. We kind of planned all along. Yeah, oh, no, 100% planned all along. And nobody calls him out on that because, you know, I mean, having been on boards, I can tell you nothing gets decided in three days. <laughs> nothing. It's, you know, there's a million variables. You have to look at every tweet he ever wrote. You have to look at every post he's ever put out in the world. You have to look at every possible, I mean, and what Reddit needed, frankly, to replace Alexis was a passionately anti-racism, pro-community, Black Lives Matter activist investor, not a buddy of ours who have, and, and by the way, how do you think Mike Seibel feels to be the, the black board member? Like how humiliating is that? Like what are your credentials? Well, I, I'm, I'm black. Hmm. I, I mean, in some ways you play that role at Y Combinator. And so it's like tokenism, right? Um, yeah, it's got, you know, but, by the way, all they could have, said, you know what, we ought to run an actual process here, even though we think it's gonna be Mike, we ought to actually bring some people in and talk to a couple people and hear from them about what Reddit's doing wrong, because there's a lot of posts about that. Big Atlantic article this week about hate in Reddit. And then we ought to like be really transparent about how we're gonna pick the right person, and then we can pick Mike. But that probably ought to take, I don't know, in, in board speak, it probably ought to take a month. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know enough about Mike to judge whether he is sort of the, the best person for the job or not. But I do think that not running a process and not being sort of transparent about the criteria for being uh, elected to the board uh, is, is a miss. Yeah, well, uh, check, check my Media Post article tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so, so so let's just do one or two more of these because the LA Times piece is so good. Um, oh, look at that. Surprisingly, <laughs> what's next? I hadn't scrolled down. Reddit. Yeah. All right. Well, we just, I mean, we just um, we yeah. chewed, we chewed on Reddit a bit. So we'll leave them alone. Um, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, look at that. Um, yeah. I mean, all of these companies, I'd say like they, this article didn't get into it. But, you know, when you look at a policy standpoint, it's like I would love companies to obviously hire more black people in leadership positions and then also to really um look at compensation right is there is there uh 
gender and racial pay disparity across roles. So I think we ought to do a whole pod on on hiring and you know because it, it opens up a great conversation about you know how hard it is to hire people that don't look like you and don't sound like you and didn't go to the same school as you and don't necessarily look at the world the same way you do and really good leaders you know surround themselves with people that are in some ways distinctly different than they are yep um uh i remember it's been now a while but being at the cafeteria uh at the googleplex and um, boy, I sure felt not welcome. I got to sit in the, in the, at the, I mean, I, I was not an engineer. Mm -hmm. And so I got to sit at the, you're not an engineer table. Um, <laughs> which by the way, means you could either be business affairs or PR or legal or all kinds of marketing. You could be all, you know, or my case, I was a CEO of a startup, but I wasn't an engineer and like it was yeah, Right, oh, second class citizen all the way. I felt it, felt it in my bones, like, mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, like the cool kids are over here, and you get to sit in the, you know, so, so, but I, but I think you know, it, it is a question. All right, so, so let's 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 button up um, for the time being. Why actions speak louder than words, and why uh, uh, Google's munis mun uh, minuscule increase a year later is not a good thing. And let's move to chapter three, which is way more light um, and I think fun. Um, and that is um, quantum dots. Yeah. Did you know that word? No, and I, I mean, it, I guess it's been a little over a year that I was looking at TVs and I do remember the salesperson in Best Buy explaining to me sort of the latest and greatest in LCD, LED, Q, LED technology. And it kind of went over my head. So I, I had to reread some of these articles a few times. Did you buy a TV? <laughs> you did buy a TV, yeah. And mm -hmm. I I couldn't, like, I'm not a gamer, but Matt, Matt is. And so he cares about like, I want the blacks to be really dark and, I don't know. We we spent like three hours in the store, <laughs> but it's impressive that this technology exists. I have a Sony Viera TV, and I was trying to hook something up to get Zoom to work on it or something the other day, and I realized that uh, not only is it antiquated, but the entire Viera software download apps smart TV site has literally been dismembered and no longer exists. So my TV is, like the screen is fine, the picture is fine, but there's no software upgrade that I'm aware of. Maybe someone who's listening knows. I looked and looked and it's pretty clear to me that uh, there was uh, no there was no way out of here other than to buy a new TV. Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, worse things have happened in my, it's 10 years old, so. And it was a 3D TV, which by the way, was a complete utter waste of time. <laughs> All right, so, so quantum dots here. So um, we went to nanowork.com, uh, uh, N-A-N-O-W-E-R-K, uh, and, and, and here's the explanation, and then we'll tell you why it matters. Um, what are quantum dots? Quantum dots, QDs, are man-made nanoscale crystals that can transport electrons. When UV light hits the semiconductor nanoparticle, they can emit light of various colors. These artificial semiconductor nanoparticles that have found applications in composites, solar cells, and fluorescent biological labels. I don't even know what that means. Um, so this came to us from our friends at IEEE Spectrum. Uh, uh, and it turns out that quantum dots speed plant growth if they shift sunlight's spectrum. Mm -hmm. So this, this is like, is like a light. big deal. Like white light, it's like also more efficient. Like white white light is, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can explain. <laughs> well, here's here's the picture. For those of you who are watching as opposed to listening, there's an image of a greenhouse 
with a whole ceiling full of quantum dots. And uh, it says, quantum dots like the one installed in the ceiling of this greenhouse, take the incoming light and shift it to a specific part of the spectrum that plants can most easily use for photosynthesis. I don't know why I found this so spectacularly cool, but it like, to me, it was like in the same realm as genetic engineering, but minus the creepy part. Well, as someone who's taken to kind of growing herbs during COVID. Uh, by the way, you can grow whatever you like. There were no judgment here. <laughs> this was, uh, I was thinking to myself like, oh, this technology is a game changer because it actually makes urban gardening that much more efficient or easier. I just think, um, I think nano anything is interesting because it takes, so, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a gamer of a different sort. So I have, for example, a great big fabulous old uh, pinball machine. And I love working on it and opening it because inside it, are things that I can understand. There's a magnet, and when the magnet goes on, the little flipper goes boop, and when the magnet goes off, the flipper goes boop the other way. And so, like, imagine if you could take the mechanics of a pinball machine and put it on the head of a pin. That's to me, like, when I try and understand nano anything, I think about my pinball machine and how it would be fun if it were like a grain of rice or, you know, the head of a pin. Um, and, and so this article, at a time when we're talking about Black Lives Matter and what's going on in Washington and election meddling and you know COVID and global warming and all this incredibly heavy shit, I was like, I just needed a dose of kind of completely good, not complicated technology to just revel in for a moment. And I want to thank the IEEE folks for providing that. Um, they, they do a lot of robots, and I like robots too. But they but they also have questionable, you know, uh, impact on society. Um, can you imagine? I mean, what if what if we find that there are certain kinds of light? Well, we know the answer to this, right? Because people get depressed in the winter time. Like there's certain kinds of light that make people emotionally healthier. Right. So why wouldn't nano nano particles, quantum yeah. dots be built into every light bulb in every office so that people feel better. It sounds like a great idea. And Wait. not have to paint them all pink. There's a whole color thing about certain colors that make and I'm like, if you go into doctor's offices, they have now all, have all this slightly off white pinkish color, which is psychological, but I would rather have, I would rather have secret nanoparticles in the ceiling. Yeah, I agree. Damn, I was hoping you'd come out against nanoparticles. No, I mean, I, I think it's, again, if, if it improves TV displays, which again, the technology itself there is always like, it kind of blows my mind. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this seems, this seems what, great. What did you buy? Oh my gosh, it's bad that I don't know off the top That's of my head. That's all right, it's, like, it's Sony, Panasonic. Yeah, software. Samsung could have been a Samsung. No, I think it's just I think it's a Sony. Yeah, yeah. But by the way, I I I I would know the name of my TV. You know what? It's it. I actually embarrassed that I don't because again, this was a major purpose pur purchase. It was like a big moment in our relationship because it was almost like we're buying it together. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very it's sweet. It's not cheap, you know, like it's like it's, thousands it's, of dollars. It's very, it's very modern. Um, I, I, my other little w victory for the weekend is I got the kitchen LEDs under the kitchen cabinets to change colors at different, depending on there's a, now there's a morning color and an evening color. Does it do it automatically or you have a setting like a, no, it's, it's all, it, in fact, it's kind of, what's what's weird is there's all these different smart softwares is the LEDs have their own software and then the Alexa has its own software and they all need to kind of they fight over who's in charge which is weird but um it actually is sunrise and sunset oh so it's just pulling from that data point and then yep. okay that's that's cool i actually although it's funny we had a debate about it it was like 
sunset's a little late in the summer. Could we do it like two hours before sunset? Like, no, that software, that, that adjustment, you can either set it at a time or you can set it at sunrise or something. Just the fact that it knows when sunrise and sunset is, and I don't. Right. <laughs> like, okay, it's smarter than I am. All right, well, with that, we are out of time. This has been really fun. Uh, I'm glad you got some sun. Uh, Listeners, uh, here, here, let me put up our, our Twitter handles because I actually have them programmed some more. Um, uh, I am at Magnify Media, and Alexa is the famous at Alexa. But don't tweet at her if you're having a problem with your Alexa device because she will not give you support. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I could spread that around. That would be very funny. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody just send her your comments. All right. See you again next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you.